My name is Glenn Howard, and uh, I'm president of the Jamestown Foundation. I'm very delighted today that you're all here uh, for what has become an annual event for Jamestown. Uh, today's event is the 8th Annual China Defense and Security Conference. Uh, we're delighted that we have a, a, a stellar uh, array of speakers today uh, brought from many parts of Europe and Asia uh, just to attend this event and also share their insights. And, and I think there's a, it's going to be a very, very fruitful discussion uh, I'm, I'm very elated that, that Matt Schrader has been uh, doing a lot of great work trying to put this conference together. Appreciate all the hard work that he has done. Also that of my staff, John Folks is here, and Abigail, our intern, who's not here, but deserves a lot of credit as well. Uh, she's out in the, in the lobby. But listen, uh, been a great year for Jamestown. Uh, many of you have seen the China Military Strategy book that's on display outside, a book edited by Joe McReynolds, um, we just learned that uh, this year we've uh, the book has been translated into Japanese. Uh, we're quite uh, happy about that, but the book recently is, uh, is going to be traded, translated into Chinese as well uh, in, in Taiwan, and so we're also very happy about that, that the work that we produce at Jamestown is continuously uh, kind of rever reverberating throughout Asia. Uh, in terms of the analysis that we provide and what makes Jamestown great at the end of the day is always the insights of the analysts, the people who write for China Brief. So uh, you're all familiar with China Brief. I don't have to describe it to you. Um, but I think that today's conference is really uh, very, uh, very unique in the sense, unlike previous conferences on China uh, defense and security that we've organized at Jamestown, uh, the, there's an unusual shadow shaping over the, over the organization or over, the, over Asia this year uh, due to the administration's current policies and the shift that's occurred in, in a more competitive direction uh, toward China as reflected by Vice President Pence's speech last Thursday. Uh, you still have people in Beijing and Washington still trying to understand the full ramifications of a more competitive U.S. policy towards Asia, towards China. Uh, a, a stance that involves, that's firmer on trade is only a much broader part of a, a, all of U.S. government response. And so we're trying to, a lot of things we're going to flush out today in the discussion is where that direction is going um, in terms of the administration's new policy. And we'll also be examining uh, many of the security components of that and the tools that, are, that China uses that range from soft power uh, and the use of Confucius Institute to the quasi-covert activities of the United Front, of which we have a whole panel on that today. So uh, so all these are shaping and also how the, the People's Liberation Army interacts, how its strategy is form, uh, formulated. So the conference is really an attempt to understand why we've arrived at this more competitive relationship. So uh, I just want to note that the second and third panels today are going to be broadcast uh, live, live stream on the web. Uh, and we're also very delighted that Randy Shriver is going to be our keynote address, and it's, this will be one of the first major speeches that he's given on China in public, uh, to my knowledge, and so uh, here in D.C. So we're, we're very happy that Randy's going to be coming and, and speaking later. So I'll turn the floor over to you, Matt, and get the show going. Hello. There we go. Oh, you guys just have one button. All right. Um, Glenn has thanked pretty much everybody I wanted to thank before we get started. So I will just thank um, all of you for being here. Uh, this doesn't work without a community of dedicated nerds who are really far, far too uh, interested in everything related to China's security. So we're very pleased to have you all here today. And I hope that this panel, this conference, is going to be educational and useful for all of you. Uh, I'm just going to do brief introductions for the gentleman here on my right because we have an illustrious guest coming and we need to stay on schedule. So very quickly, I'm going to start off with Dr. Willie Lamb, who is the senior fellow here at Jamestown. And in addition to that title, holds a number of others that I'm going to pull up in just a second. He is the adjunct professor at the Center for China Studies at the History Department and the Program of Masters in Global Political Economy at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He's also the author of a number of books on the politics of Hong Kong. And since he's our senior fellow, I want to take the opportunity to brag just a little bit that I think you predicted in 2012 that Xi Jinping was going to get rid of term limits and stay on as president for life. 
Yeah, 2013, uh, which is astounding. Um, and at, as far as I know of, the first person to make that prediction. Uh, to his right is Dennis Wilder, who is a senior fellow with the Initiative for U.S.-China Dialogue on Global Issues at Georgetown University. Uh, for many, many years, he was one of the U.S. intelligence community's foremost experts on China, East Asia, and the PLA. Um, I can also testify that he is an excellent professor, um, one of the best that I've ever had. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And to his right is Jude Blanchett who is the senior advisor and China practice lead at the Crumpton Group, helping clients to navigate market entry negotiations and business operations, as well as a number of other things that he does very well. Um, he also has a distinguished career in political science and analysis of Chinese politics. And I think you also have a book coming out quite soon, don't you? But when, when is that going to come out? Uh, June next year. And it's on the politics of... Neo Maoist. Okay, so we need to make sure to plug his book as well because his work is excellent and the book will be as well. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to put up the PowerPoint for Dr. Willie Lamb. And Dr. Willie Lamb is going to get us started with our conference here today. Okay, uh, <clears throat> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It, it, it's indeed a great privilege uh, for myself to be um, invited back to Jamestown, with which I've been associated for like more than 10 years. So my uh, sincere gratitude to Glenn and also to Matt for uh, facilitating this. And I'm very happy to see you. Um, given the time limits, uh, I won't be speaking too long, but perhaps uh, we can have um, uh, discuss other issues during the Q&A session and, and during lunch and so forth. Well, first of all, uh, my brief uh, is to talk about the impact of the trade war and uh, the much more important uh, U.S.-China struggle for supremacy on domestic Chinese politics. Um, well, first of all, uh, we need to understand Xi Jinping. Uh, Matt just pointed out that... Um, I made the prediction in 2013 that uh, he would uh, seek to become a quote-unquote emperor for life until uh, perhaps 2033 when he will be 80 years old. Well, in the Chinese context, of course, uh, a person who has, uh, who is 80 uh, is, is um, said to be to have just crossed the threshold to middle age. So. Uh, and uh, according to C, um, According to his most famous um, slogan, Chinese Dream, uh, by the centenary of the establishment of the People's Republic in 2049, uh, China will have closed the gap with the US. China will have emerged as the sole superpower in the world. However, um, Xi is not a, uh, a policy wonk, nor is he a, a naval administrator. So, um, a lot of the problems which uh, we uh, in uh, Beijing and Hong Kong have seen is that uh, Xi has not reacted tactfully or uh, strategically um, regarding Donald Trump's um, multi-pronged uh, attack on China because, as I said at the beginning, it's not just about deficits, about dollars and cents. It's about the struggle for supremacy, um, as the world's premier hegemon, uh, but it's also primarily because uh, a, a struggle between two ways of life, the Chinese way of doing things and the uh, US ways of doing things. That means uh, laissez-faire uh, economics, doing things according to uh, <clears throat> global norms and so forth. So, um,
Okay, so, um, so until recently, uh, well, Xi's power is no longer in doubt uh, because in March this year he uh, abrogated the term limits in the part, uh, in the uh, PRC constitution, making him effectively uh, the leader for life. Uh, however, um, it has also become very apparent that uh, he has he doesn't have what it takes to um, parry the many thrusts uh, put upon China by uh, a series of uh, attacks, if you will, by by Donald Trump. So uh, he, in uh, trying to um, negotiate uh, terms with the U.S., is going back to his Maoist roots. So that's why he said uh, a few weeks ago at Heilongjiang province uh, in the northeast that, uh, well, um, worst come to the worst, we'll go back to uh, self-reliance and we'll rely more on uh, the uh, uh, state planning. Uh, I won't go into detail as to um, the setback which Xi Jinping uh, suffered in uh, July. Uh, there was intense speculation, uh, which was, of course, just rumor, that um, on July 11th, there was what was known as the moral equivalent of a coup d'etat in Beijing. And, uh, well, it has proven to be just a rumor. However, Xi Jinping did disappear for uh, 10 days. Uh, inexplicably, uh, his portraits have been removed. Uh, various um, senior ac academic units have dropped studying uh, Xi Jinping's um, otherworldly uh, pronouncements when he was a um, sent down youth uh, to Shanxi province. And uh, um, <clears throat> most strangely, um, his image and his dictums disappeared totally from the front page of the People's Daily for four or five days. And um, it's also interesting that uh, as uh, is usual for these cases, when, when the emperor is under attack, his um, closest allies would orchestrate what uh, in Chinese is called a biao tai, that means a public profession of fealty to the, to the uh, paramount leader. And, uh, Li Jianshu, who is a member of the Political Standing Committee and arguably the one cadre close, closest to Xi Jinping, has in mid July engineered this uh, uh, clause saying that uh, all the party cadres and, and officials should uh, respect Xi Jinping's ability to, uh, well, in Chinese, yi uh, shui yin, that means to um, call the final shots and also to uh, that means to settle differences with utmost authority. However, unlike on previous occasions, very few um, warlords from the regions or from the um, military actually um, participated in this Biao Tai or uh, uh, ritual of public declaration of support for Xi Jinping. Um, well, the complaints or, or uh, unhappiness of, of uh, cadres, both civilian and military, about Xi Jinping uh, are clear. That um, it wasn't until June, uh, July, or even August that Xi Jinping realized that uh, what Trump was after was not just cutting the deficit. What Trump was after was uh, putting immense pressure on China to cut away with uh, heavy-handed state planning uh, to um, also to attack China's very uh, amb ultra ambitious uh, high tech program, the so-called Made in China 225 program. Uh, Donald Trump is also targeting uh, Taiwan, playing the Taiwan card. And also uh, Donald Trump, together with his American allies, have been playing tough in uh, freedom of navigation uh, sales in the uh, South China Sea. So it's a multi-pronged, multifaceted attack, which uh, the sea people uh, had no inkling of at, at the beginning. And uh, when they responded, um, it was not very successful, partly because of the Chinese system. So I said at the outset that 
the struggle for supremacy between China and the U.S. is ultimately about systems, about which governance system works better. And in the case of Xi Jinping, um, well before this financial, uh, this trade war crisis, uh, we have seen Xi Jinping arrogating all powers of financial and economic decision making uh, within himself, or to be more precisely, within the Central Finance and Economics Commission, which is headed by himself. So. Uh, there has been uh, evidence of uh, a disarray, lack of cooperation amongst the state council uh, ministries to the to the point that at one at one time the uh, the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, openly laid into the finance ministry, saying that the finance ministry had not had not done enough to uh, try to um, uh, prop up the uh, economy. Uh, there are also problems with the fact that uh, Li Keqiang, who is supposed to be looking after the economy, the Prime Minister Li Keqiang, uh, has been sidelined and uh, uh, he is very bitter about the fact that uh, he um, is not allowed to participate in uh, decision-making uh, efforts. Um, in order to demonstrate China's um, exceptionism, if you will, or, or China's ability to uh, perhaps uh, build a, an anti-US coalition. Uh, Xi Jinping has been spending huge uh, numbers, huge amounts of money and resources in trying to gain the support of uh, former US allies and in particular Africa. So in, in this uh, China-Africa forum, uh, not too long ago, Xi Jinping spent 60 billion US dollars in loans and uh, low interest rates to the African states. Uh, but this, I'm afraid, will, will not help China's position uh, in the short run. So um, in response to, to, to uh, Donald Trump's unprecedented attack on, on the uh, China model and the China system, Xi Jinping is actually going back to Maui's woods. And it's very ironical because this year, um, we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the start of the reform and open door policy kicked off by the great arch architect of reform, Deng Xiaoping, in uh, December 1978. Uh, but what uh, officials, intellectuals are seeing is that uh, Xi Jinping has stood many of Deng Xiaoping's key dictums on, on their heads, on their heads. So um, despite the fact that uh, by late August, Xi Jinping seems to have clawed back much of his power. We see uh, attacks, perhaps uh, indirect, uh, couched in um, uh, understatements, but attacks coming from uh, different factions, and I'll, I'll, I'll just speak through them now. Uh, the first group of enemies against Xi Jinping consists of the uh, other um, members of the so-called gang of princelings, that means the sons and daughters of party elders. Um, and many of the sons and princelings were very close to Deng Xiaoping, so they are very mad that Xi Jinping is now giving up many of Deng Xiaoping's uh, edicts about reform. So here I illustrate the... Um, yes, here I illustrate the... The Deng Xiaoping family. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. The the Deng Xiaoping family and also uh, General Liu Yuan, a, a a very popular uh, general who is the son of the China's first president Liu Shaoqi, who was, as most of us know, uh, persecuted to death in nineteen. 66. So these uh, um, princelings who actually grew up with uh, Xi Jinping in the 50s and 60s, they were very unhappy about what he has done to the uh, major reforms of the patriarch. Uh, there are also other uh, examples. For example, the, yes. Well, on, on the left, of course, is uh, uh, Hu Yaobang, China's most, perhaps, most famous liberal icon. So his son, uh, 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 Hu Dehua and Hu Deping, uh, were actually quite close to Xi Jinping when they were growing up together. And 
when Xi Jinping became general secretary in 2012, uh, Hu Deping actually uh, ran many reformist ideas past Xi Jinping, but unfortunately Xi Jinping adopted none of them, okay? None of them, okay. Uh, apart from the um, powerful clans, powerful factions uh, within the party, uh, we have uh, also to note the two uh, factions which uh, had been dominant within the parties uh, before Xi Jinping came to power, namely the uh, the Shanghai faction led by President Jiang Zemin and the uh, Youth League faction led by uh, former President Hu Jintao. So these two factions have now been sidelined and uh, they are all victims of the same weapon, and that is Xi Jinping has used the anti-corruption apparatus as a very potent weapon to in intimidate, to sideline, and to get rid of his enemies. Um, it's also not surprising that um, as, it's also very not surprising that uh, as um, some of the senior party officials uh, ex expressed Xi Jinping uh, dissatisfaction as Xi Jinping is turning back the clock on reform, there are a number of uh, very influential, influential uh, intellectuals. Uh, yeah a number of uh, um, influential intellectuals who uh, were bold enough to say that actually um, this pressure coming from Trump might not be too bad because uh, Trump's advice that uh, the Chinese uh, economy be run by more market forces might do good uh, to the Chinese economy. And they're saying that similar to the result of China's accession to the World Trade Organization, it might not be too bad a thing because in the case of the World Trade Organization, uh, pressure from the outside has actually had actually resulted in expediting uh, the uh, economic growth and reform of, of the Chinese economy. Uh, of course, I, I won't go into details about this. Uh, uh, the the words of advice to the uh, Chinese intellectuals, but uh, well, time is running out, so I'll just say a few words about the private entrepreneurs, the private entrepreneurs. Well, um, Xi Jinping actually from day one has been um, very in insistent on um, making the SOE, the state owned enterprise conglomerate, stronger, bigger, and better, okay? So this conviction um, has not been changed by uh, attacks from Donald Trump, uh, just on the opposite. Uh, he now realizes that as the Chinese economy is in a dicey situation, the state must rely on this huge conglomerates to maintain stability. And this has, uh, this has um, unquestionably and understandably arisen the resentment of the private sector because the private sector uh, has been losing ground to the state sector, uh, according to my calculation more than 30 of the more successful private enterprises is listed on the Shanghai stock market have been forced by executive fiat to accept investments from state owned enterprises. So, um, summing up, we see that uh, because of Xi Jinping's insistence on sticking to the old ways, and in fact on uh, a certain degree of uh, restoration of Maoism, uh, he has arisen the anger of uh, major factions within the party, uh, intellectuals, um, entrepreneurs, and so forth. Uh, but as to whether this um, discernible um, criticism might translate into some political action, uh, we will we'll leave this to the Q&A period. <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot. Thank you. And sorry for taking too much time. Thank you, Glenn, Matt, who, by the way, was an excellent student. I need to, uh, and I'm delighted that he uh, got this position at the Jamestown Foundation. I think he's doing a terrific job. 
uh, and thank you to the Jamestown Foundation for inviting me. I won't try and compete with Lily, uh, Lily on either slides or um, content because clearly uh, he is one of the great experts on Chinese domestic politics. Um, I knew Willie from the early 1990s, at least, when I served in Hong Kong at the US Consulate General. Uh, my only frustration with him is I'd have lunch with him, he'd tell me nothing, and the next day he'd have an exclusive in the South China Morning Post on a very interesting issue. So he's a great reporter, uh, knows how to protect his sources, and uh, clearly has stayed very much up to date. What I want to do is maybe take this from a different angle and maybe even a more optimistic angle than the one that uh, Willie has presented. First of all, I think we need to go back to the beginning of the Trump administration to realize that China was knocked off balance by the Trump administration from day one. They really did not think that the model that had been established for 40 years of US-China relations was going to be uh, overturned in the way that Trump did. They thought, like many uh, American presidents, he would talk tough on the campaign trail and then moderate once he got in office. And indeed, it seemed to start that way with the Mar-a-Lago summit, the decision to establish the comprehensive economic dialogue. But the problem with that was that the Chinese thought of the comprehensive economic dialogue as what they had done with the Obama administration in the strategic and economic dialogue, which is talk the subjects to death and make meaningless commitments on reforms. Uh, so what happened in the first CED and the only CED China comes up with a very thin beer concession that they would cut domestic steel production capacity by 150 million metric tons by 2020, or 2022, excuse me. Well, President Trump rejected this out of hand, and the comprehensive economic dialogue ceases to function at this point. Fast forward to 2018, and we see Xi Jinping send his right-hand man, Liu He, on the economy to Washington twice to try and negotiate a way out of the impasse. Again, the Chinese side either missed the signals or chose to miss the signals from Washington and tried to stave off sanctions by trying to buy the Trump administration off with 70 billion in purchases of energy, agriculture, and manufacturing products. Now, today the Chinese say they are confused that they don't know what the US wants. I think this rings very hollow. Every single senior CEO of the United States, every single economist in the United States that they talk to, every member of the administration has put on the table what China needs to do in terms of structural reform. It isn't hard to figure out. But my experience with the Chinese is what they really want is for us to put a proposal on the table and then they start negotiating it down. I've seen this over and over again in negotiations with the Chinese. First of all, their system isn't creative enough. Their uh, negotiators are worried about Xi Jinping and how he's going to respond to any creative ideas. The system, the Chinese bureaucratic system is risk adverse. And consequently, what they really want is for the Trump administration to put the proposal on the table. I think wisely the Trump administration has said, no, we're not gonna negotiate with ourselves. You know what needs to happen. But of course, as uh, Willie has said, what would it mean to do what the United States wants? It means to change the Chinese model. And national champions in areas like the service sector would have to compete on a level playing field with the United States. I think today Beijing is shocked at how the American consensus has emerged around the need for significant change in the relationship. China has tried and failed, and you'll hear more about this, I'm sure today, to energize farmers, governors, CEOs, politicians to oppose the tariffs. I think the most notable thing about Vice President Pence's speech the other day is how little domestic criticism you are seeing from the Democrats or anybody else about this speech. It shows that the center of gravity in US politics on this issue
has definitely moved. And now China faces a situation where the tariffs are undeniably having a larger impact on the Chinese economy than the US economy. Chinese economy, as you know, was already facing headwinds and Beijing is putting aside its commitment to deleveraging now to keep the economy from slowing because of the impact of these tariffs. Earlier this week, China cut the reserve ratio that Chinese banks are required to hold, freeing up 175 billion in capital to inject into the economy. China has also announced it's raising the tax rebates. They did this once already this year. These new rebates for exporters will take effect on November 1st. Consumer confidence in China is down, car sales down, manufacturing down. The IMF is now predicting China's GDP next year will be down to 6.2%, the lowest in decades. And of course, Shanghai stock market is down around 20%, including a 5% fall yesterday. Renminbi down 10% this year. So this really does raise concerns about domestic stability. And in fact, last week, the New York Times reported on a document they saw that told the Chinese internal press that you are not to report on worse than expected data that could show the economy is slowing, local government debt risks, signs of declining consumer confidence. Now, Willie has talked to you today about this sort of neo-Maoist approach that he thinks is coming uh, to the fore. I have my doubts about this. Um, I think the Chinese are pragmatic enough to know that they cannot afford to, if you will, go it alone and self-sufficiency. Throughout this period of escalating tensions, some shoes haven't dropped on the Chinese side. US companies are not reporting massive retaliation. You don't see the Chinese uh, calling for boycotts of American goods like they did in the Thad experience. Uh, next month, President Xi will preside over a Shanghai import export, uh, expo, and you will see him wooing uh, Western countries. I think the reason is China really does still need Western markets expertise and technology. It's just not in their interest to try and split the world because I don't think they think they would win that struggle. I think they have to worry about the fact that President Trump has renegotiated with Canada, Mexico, South Korea, next Japan. My belief that the Chinese still want to deal with Trump. Uh, before the two billion in tariffs goes up to 25% at the end of the year. Again, they've reacted cautiously to the trade war. And um, I think that they're eager for this meeting between Xi Jinping and President Trump at the G20 in Buenos Aires. I know they are because they've talked to me about it. They have lost faith that they can cut a deal with his underlings because Trump is the only one who really can cut this deal. In many ways, they're hoping they can achieve a personal breakthrough in the manner that Kim Jong-un achieved a personal uh, breakthrough in Singapore. Ironically, they may see Trump as their last best hope to avoid the lengthy and destabilizing trade war. But the key is whether Xi Jinping and the rest of the leadership is ready to carry through on the kinds of market reforms that China needs. Remember that at the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress, they made promises to make markets the decisive force in the economy. But these were never implemented in the last five years. And Xi Jinping now has a very big decision to make. Is he going to try and find a way to meet some of the American demands? Or as Willie says, will he try simply to go it alone? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilder. That was a tour de force. And now, Jude Blanchett. Thanks, Matt. Uh, it's, an, it's an honor to be here. Really a pleasure to share the, uh, the dais with uh, Professor Wilder and, and Professor Lamb. I think also just hearing their presentations um, an indication that the phrase reading the tea leaves doesn't quite um, 
isn't quite apposite here. You know, as folks know, reading the tea leaves had its origin in, in medieval Europe where people used to read ink splats and uh, molten lead to try and divine the future, which then I guess had an evolution into reading actual tea in a cup. Um, but uh, obviously what, what you're seeing with, with uh, Professor Wilder and Professor Lamb is, is a bit more, uh, it's a bit more um, accurate than that. Um, but nonetheless, we are in a position now where we're making evaluations of China and its intentions based on, I don't like the word a black box, I usually call it a dimly lit box. Uh, and under Xi Jinping, our ability to get insight into the political system um, has really deteriorated ra rapidly. Even, even the fun rumor mongering that most of us are used to ha has gotten much more difficult. So um, what I'd like to suggest today in the next nine or so minutes is a return to, I think, a more structural analysis of, of Chinese politics given that I think the opacity of the system is likely to increase moving forward, not, not decrease. To understand Chinese political system, I think moving forward, we'd be better to be reading books on Stalin than we would on democratization uh, and the path of, let's say, South Korea. Um, and so I want to start today with, with two dates. Uh, one is August 18th, 1980, when Deng Xiaoping gave, I think, the most prescient speech uh, of his political career. Uh, on the reform of the political and state leadership system. If I, the title, I think, is something like that, where he essentially outlines four pathologies that were affecting China's government system and governance system un under Mao Zedong. And those four, and there's only four he lists, are over-centralization of power at the top, the, the top leader holding too many concurrent posts. As he says, there's a limit to anyone's energy and time. The party taking over for the responsibilities of the government, the state council. And he says we need to solve the long-term issue of leadership succession. And if I were going to name four pathologies that I think uh, have been introduced or reintroduced uh, since 2012, uh, I would say it would be those four. The next date is June 1981, where the party releases the, its resolution on certain historical events since the founding of the People's Republic of China. Its second attempt at codifying history, the first happened in 1945. And in their reevaluation of the Mao Zedong era, they are careful. They never say 70-30, by the way, on Mao. That's a, uh, that was never any official pronouncement. Um, but they do say that Mao Zedong had arrogated power to himself and had made himself more important than the Central Committee. That was one of the uh, crimes he was uh, accused of. And again, returning back to today, I would say that we see a general secretary who has arrogated power that puts him uh, in a position far superior to that of the Central Committee, nominally his, his boss. Um, and so what does that mean, practically speaking? And this is where I'd like to argue for a return to a structural analysis of politics. Um, although we're entering a new time with China, and I would argue that even the CCP has no idea what it's doing, given the fact that it is now in an increasingly complex, and for China, an increasingly integrated uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the global economy and, and a lot of the powers that it is entering into strategic competition with. Um, we do know something about the deep logic of authoritarian politics. So to Professor Lam's quite prescient uh, um, um, uh, comment about Xi Jinping abolishing term limits, I'd say that there was some pretty good academic research that's been coming out prior to the MPC this March, which was predicting if you have a breakdown of, of coalitions, if essentially there is no opposition force, then term limits and authoritarian systems are likely uh, to break down because once a leader has, in a sense, reached escape velocity vis-a-vis -vis any oppositional group, why the heck would you keep a term limit? Um, our, our, our president here has uh, at least floated the idea of staying in power for longer. That's not unique. Once you get to the throne, most people don't want to give it up. And in that sense, Xi Jinping is just human. Um, and so I wonder if where we are today in terms of China's governance capacity under Xi Jinping has the centralization of power uh, made China a, a more effective governance system or a less effective governance system. And again, I think we can return to some of the deeper underlying logic of, of authoritarian politics to see what happens when power is concentrated at the top but in a way that is non-institutionalized. Chinese politics is very personalized. You, you don't 
become the Ibasho. You don't become the top leader simply by getting the position of general secretary, right? Uh, it took Jiang Zemin five years to essentially uh, have full control over the political system dis despite having held the title of general secretary since, since uh, 1989. Uh, Hu Jintao obviously had quite a time uh, carving out enough power to effectively govern. Uh, that's in, in contradistinction to the United States, the second Obama leaves power, the second he leaves the office, his power diminishes, right? And the second you assume the power of the presidency, uh, you don't have to spend five years battling with, well, sorry, four years battling with, with opponents to be able to make decisions. Um, so looking forward, given what I've just said, uh, and given the pathologies that I think have been reintroduced into the political system, I see uh, China as having a few trajectories. One is, I think Xi Jinping, uh, maybe this is where I'll let 100 flowers broom, bloom and, and slightly disagree with Professor Lam. Um, I think there's no opposition that matters in China today. Um, there's no Chen Yun to, to Deng Xiaoping. Um, there is no effective opposition that controls any of the means by which they can constrain a leader. Uh, Xu Zhongrun writing an essay as he's dying of cancer, uh, I don't think is enough. Hu Daping, uh, you know, who saw his uh, magazine Yan Huang Chun Cho shut down with, with uh, little or no repercussions, um, I, I, uh, I think are not indications of any serious opposition. And I think of Xi Jinping as being in a position similar to that of Stalin after the purges. He may be unpopular, um, but I guess, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do about it? Um, and in a way, if you could almost look back at Xi Jinping's first five years in power and look at it as coup-proofing the regime as much of anything, whether that's from installing his personal bodyguard at the Central Guard Bureau, which control the actual physical security and healthcare of all top leaders, to what the military restructuring has allowed him to do, which is when you take people out of power, you open up a seat where you can put your people into power. Um, so I, sus I suspect Xi Jinping will stay in power forever or as long as he can. Um, and I don't think we should expect some pendulum swing because of endogenous forces being able to uh, arrest power away. And the last thing, and I realize I'm probably getting close to my time, um, and like, like best man speeches, no one has ever complained when someone on a dais has spoken for, for too short of a time. Um, right, now, right now, China is undergoing one of the most complete and thorough transformations of its political system. This was outlined in March at the National People's Congress. This was the, the great government restructuring. Um, that because of the, uh, the news uh, sort of period we're in hasn't gotten much coverage, but it's competing with North Korea, it's competing with Donald Trump, so it, it's, it's easy to see how that's happening. But um, it, there, this is a paradigm shift that we're seeing in China's political system with the party uh, now taking over, I think, and, and if I'm being somewhat provocative, essentially abolishing effectively the government as a distinct uh, entity, and it is now the party that is running everything very nakedly. The mask has come off, and this is going back to Deng's August 18th, 1980 speech. Uh, a significant uh, is a significant, I think, trajectory change, and one depending on how you want to you want to put it, a return to the past. And so, understanding what it's like to have the world's second largest economy run by the Communist Party is something I think we should all become much more uh, uh, concerned with. Um, and although I don't know, uh, my, my crystal ball is not nearly as refined as, as Professor Lamb, so I don't know what, what the future holds here. I think we need to update our heuristics for understanding China. Uh, and for me, one that makes the most sense is this structural analysis, understanding how authoritarian systems work in comparative politics and bringing that, bringing that to bear on China. Uh, and with that, I will... Uh, stop talking. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, thank you all. That was that was excellent. Um, I have something like fifteen questions. I'm only going to ask, we'll say one and a half, because there's a lot of extremely intelligent, curious people in the audience that I think should get the chance to ask questions and. Are our mic runners ready in the back? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, we'll call this a, a half a question. It, anybody up here on this panel have any idea what's going on with that Bloomberg story? This, for those who don't know, Bloomberg broke this huge story about how the PLA has essentially hacked American supply chains and put 
hacked servers inside of Amazon, Apple, and a number of other major corporations. Um, and Apple and Amazon have denied this vociferously, which is very unusual. It's not a no comment. They've come out and said, no, this hasn't happened. And Bloomberg has stood by the reporting. So as of right now, everybody I've talked to has no idea what's going on. And I was wondering maybe if there's somebody up in the panel, I don't know, somebody who used to be in the intelligence community who maybe might know some people. <laughs> um, I'm going to say it bluntly. I, I think the reporters got this story wrong. Um, I First of all, if you look at that microprocessor that was pictured, a lot of people say couldn't do the things that they claim it can do. So on the technical side, there is a lot of suspicion of this argument. Um, I'm not saying that these reporters you know, were perpetrating a hoax. Maybe they just didn't understand some of the technical things that they received. Um, but I think uh, the de denials from Apple and others and the fact that US government agencies don't seem to know anything about this uh, would suggest that um, this is an inaccurate story. Now, does that mean the Chinese aren't trying to do things like this? Of course they're trying to do things like this. But this one just may have been um, an, an exaggeration on the part of these reporters. Okay, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. That's right. Yeah. Okay, real question for the whole panel. Um, the, the U.S. government has outlined a, what it's calling a more competitive strategy with China. And at the same time in Beijing, there seems to be a dawning realization that, in fact, this is what is happening, um, that this isn't going to go away. And Professor Wilder, you got into this in some depth in your speech. Um, are we able to say, to trace out the outlines at least of what a policy response to this U.S., this new U.S. consensus might look like and i don't necessarily mean like what's beijing's plan going to be because there's going to be a lot of things shaping what happens in beijing but what might we expect to see coming out of beijing in response to this new u.s stance over the next months and even years so you know any of you who have any thoughts on this i'm curious and then after this we'll we'll open it up to the floor I can hazard a guess with yeah. the caveat that yeah. I, I mean, we're, we're all guessing. I, mean, so. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but that. Um, <laughs> so I, I completely agree with Professor Wilder that I've, I've found it um, perplexing, the idea that China is just utterly unaware of what it's supposed to do or, or what the U.S., what the ask of the United States is. And again, I think the caveat is it was a, it was a broad ask. Um, but if I were advising Xi Jinping, uh, and I don't think many people are, um, but if I were, uh, I would say, obviously, the, th the needle you've got a thread here is uh, Xi Jinping can't look like he is essentially bowing or kowtowing to, to US pressure here. He has his own, again, a, a, I think a, a thing we often lose in, in uh, analysis of China is China has politics too. Um, it just has only one source of fake news, and that is state media, rather than uh, a multiplicity of, of news sources. So it's able to control the narrative. And we have a sort of an asymmetry of analysis here, where we assume that China is visionary. It's planning five billion years into the future. Um, but that's because it doesn't have the New York Times going and talking to disaffected advisors who are pissed off, or it's not talking with farmers in, in Anhui about how uh, how uh, the trade war is, is, is harming them. Um, but I think, so Xi Jinping has his own political constituency. He's got to, he can't look weak. Um, so I would find a way to essentially bring forth a package of policies that will move, in one sense, the, the, the U.S. business community, but not only the U.S., this is a global pushback against China. If we were in Berlin, if we were in Canberra, if we were in London, we'd be having a much similar discussion about, about China. So people sort of putting this on Trump, I think, missed the much more structural tension that exists here. But nonetheless, um, this is the 40th anniversary of reform and opening. If I were Xi Jinping, I would use December as an opportunity to make a speech. And in that speech, I would announce a series of actions that would move the US business community, but more importantly, MNCs more, more, more globally, from being on the sidelines slash slightly angry at China for not ever uh, coming through on the third plenums, which they waited with bated breath for since 2013, to now moving them to be more engaged advocates for China in, in, in capitals and in their government relations functions. And there are enough 
things that China can do that will slide under the radar of the of the the nationalists who I spend most of my time reading uh, about in China. Um, you know, it is the case that a lot of my work revolves revolves around uh, uh, in helping companies decide what the heck to do about a party committee, which is now knocking on the door and asking for stepped up involvement in the corporate governance structure. We spend a lot of time talking with companies who are trying to get out of a forced JV in order to enter the market uh, in China. We're looking at all the soft predation, or, or uh, what China calls qualitative measures, uh, which make life very difficult for US companies. Uh, we're, we're talking about the rather overt uh, theft of intellectual property, uh, which China, the Beijing is not totally able to control, uh, but certainly has more uh, ha has more uh, of uh, control than it than it lets on. I would announce a, a, a package of policies which are rather technocratic, which will be a dog whistle to the global business community. Uh, you know, raising it, raising sort of equity caps, which has been happening in finance and in automotives, is a really good example of that. That didn't that didn't upset the the sort of neo Maoist nationalists. Uh, online because that's just way too inside baseball for them. So China has a lot of room there, I think, to signal on the economic front uh, that it's willing to play ball. Now, on the military front, it's a much different thing. I think there, there's nothing China can do short of raising a white flag um, that will, uh, I think, indicate that there's not going to be some structural competition between the U.S. and China. Um, it's way outside of my, my, my uh, expertise. Uh, but at least on the economic side, uh, I think there's a lot that, that China can do. And, and using smuggling it in under the 40th anniversary of reform and opening, uh, I think, would be the way I would advise them. Yeah, I think we've got somebody up here who knows a little bit about the, the PRC military. <laughs> Sorry, I keep picking on you, Professor Wilder. Well, I think that there's a – first of all, this has come up very fast on Beijing. Uh, I'm sorry. I, okay. I think this has come up very quickly on Beijing. They they really didn't see the kind of speech Pence gave and the remarks by Matt Pottinger coming. They knew that something had changed in Washington. They've sent several delegations here. But one of the debates in Beijing is, what is this? Is this a storm? and they can work their way through this storm. And a lot of the language you see in the Chinese press is about, you know, there will be a sunny day on the other side of this terrible uh, period. Or is it climate change? Is it fundamental change in the US-China relationship? And of course, depending on how you look at this, you, you don't know because is Trump a one-term president? Um, would it get better under another president? Uh, certainly you could argue that the processes would probably be more to China's liking than the ones that Trump has used. But, you know, there are a lot of variables here, and I think Beijing is still trying to work through the variables on exactly what competition means. They don't like the term. I have been in Beijing several times in the last year, and they constantly... Uh, worry about the term competition. They don't really believe that we can have a healthy competition. Mm. And this may be, and I defer to Willie, maybe a difference in cultures. You know, we love football. We love hitting each other on the field and then shaking hands and having a beer. Um, I'm not sure the Chinese uh, see it that way. Well, just, just very briefly. Um, <clears throat> Well, on the word competition, I think um, well, the Chinese have qualms using it in the public media because the idea of competition um, necessarily presupposes a winner and a loser, right? And at this stage, I think most Chinese realize that uh, the, 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 uh, the PRC doesn't seem to have as, as, as many bullets or, or cards to play as the Americans. Uh, they, they, by the way, they also banned the word um, the, the phrase made in China 225 uh, because of the perception that it, it sounds too provocative. But anyway, returning to what Matt said earlier, I think, um, well, Xi Jinping, uh, despite the many doubts about his um, intellectual capacity, the fact that he never went through beyond uh, junior high school, uh, is plotting a, a counterattack, plotting a counterattack. So uh, I think as um, 
Professor Wilder said, uh, there's a big uh, import uh, meeting, a global import meeting coming up in December, and I think he will also take advantage of the 40th anniversary of the reform and open door policy to lay out a, a, a new a plethora of uh, at least reformist sounding rhetoric. For example, uh, the announcement of more free trade zones, more free trade ports, uh, and and so forth, and and also a um, significant uh, reduction on capital control for uh, foreign businesses, at least those um, based in these uh, foreign trade zones and so forth. Uh, geopolitically, uh, what they are doing, uh, I think they would persevere with, and that is to build up a. Um, so-called anti-isolationist world coalition, uh, of course, targeting the, the U.S. Uh, the Chinese are very uh, nervous about this so-called poison pill clause in the uh, recent uh, U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, the fact that if uh, one of the signatories were to... Um, do a similar deal with a uh, non-market economy state, then the other parties could with, withdraw from that uh, treaty six months later. Uh, it seems to be the intention of Washington to extend this um, criteria, This uh, that, that means containing the so-called person bill clause, to uh, uh, ongoing negotiations with the EU and, 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 and Japan. The, the Chinese are very nervous about this. And... Um, Lastly, I think um, they have done very well in the past 20 years in, in lobbying uh, huge U.S. multinationals uh, who are enjoying a big chunk of the China market. So I think I, I, I've heard from some businessmen that uh, they have doubled down on this, saying that if uh, Trump uh, were to persevere in um, hemming China in, then they might... Uh, provide more preferential policies to European or Japanese or South Korean uh, companies. Of course, this this, this uh, looks like a, a replay of the traditional um, uh, stick and carrot policy, which may or may not work. But I think uh, after having caught short, having been surprised uh, by the um, ferocity and um, multi-pronged nature of the Trump um, uh, advance uh, in May and June. I think the Chinese now uh, have indeed put together something uh, to counteract this, perhaps the the most serious crisis faced by Xi Jinping in the past six years. Okay, thank you all. Um, we have about a little less than 20 minutes for questions. So I think we should have time for about two, three, maybe four questions if we're lucky. Um, if you are from a media organization, please do uh, identify yourself as such when you ask the questions. So let's get started. And all the questions are up here in the front. So Mike Runners, faster, faster. Come on, you're young. Hi, uh, Trudy Rubin from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, it, it, you've talked about the reaction on, on the, of surprise on the Chinese side. How do you evaluate the effectiveness of the approach on the Trump-Pence side? Uh, the swiftness with which this came in, the claims by the vice president of Chinese interference in domestic elections and politics. Um, is this approach the best way to try to get results, even assuming, which is a big assumption, that there could be a response on the Chinese side of, of the kind uh, that Jude Blanchett suggested? Well, first of all, um, you know, I am a traditional Republican, so I believe in free trade. Um, and so tariffs are not my favorite thing. But I think the difficulty the American system has is, so what's the alternative? Is the alternative to go back to what we've been doing in the past that hasn't produced results? And so far, I have not seen anybody persuasively out there argue 
another approach that has any hope of working. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm reluctant to say this is the wrong approach because I don't know that there's a, another better approach. It may be a lousy approach in some ways from a free trade standpoint. It's protectionist. But uh, I think, frankly, Xi Jinping has, has forced the United States into taking uh, options like this. I'll just add a, again, this is well in the realm of I don't know what I'm talking about, but if I were, it's the thing that you're I way, find. You're way too modest, you. I, what I find slightly, uh, so I, I roughly agree with, with what Professor Wilder said um, in the sense that um, I, I think at least now something calling a strategy is coming into focus, where I think six months ago it was hard to see the disparate parts as being anything but but disparate. Um, I guess the, the part I find a little bit perplexing is if I were looking to essentially, and again, this isn't about changing the colors of China. This is not about getting rid of SOEs. We had SOEs 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We weren't on a collision course. This is not about industrial planning. China's had industrial planning for, for forever. This, this is not, those are, those are red herrings. I, red herring? Strawman, one of the two. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I think those are distractions here. This is, again, to, to just, basically, I'm just going to echo everything he just said. But um, I think what I, f I find perplexing is if I were looking to create a strategy to bend China's trajectory back towards what we were seeing in the late 90s, early 2000s, which is you still have a Communist Party, still have SOEs, but it's one towards global engagement, uh, towards integrating with the global, global system rather than trying to uh, break, bend it. Um, I would be doing everything I can to utilize the, the global nature of this pushback against China. So again, just to, to uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm struck by how similar the conversation, uh, uh, how do I finish the sentence? I, the conversation that's happening in capitals around the world, especially Europe, uh, especially obviously New Zealand and Australia, uh, in the same way we've had our CFIUS here with, fir with the FIRMA update, you know, you, you have an investment screening law which is being debated right now in the EU. Uh, Australia has been stepping up investment screening of, of China. They're not calling it China, but it's China. Um, concerns about China's more predatory state capitalism are, are nearly u universal in a lot of the developed economies. So I would be finding a way to harness that and channel that, those, those tailwinds, rather than, I won't put a word on it, but, but something else which appears to be uh, squandering, uh, squandering that. I would add one other thing, and I think this is a tool that the United States has used effectively in the past and China likes that this administration seems reluctant, and that is back channel, mm. out of public negotiation. Mm. Um, you know, we're into megaphone diplomacy at this point. Um, I don't know that that gets you where you need to go. The most successful American negotiations with China, uh, think of the, the uh, normalization negotiations, took place in private. And it is, I think you have to give the Chinese the ability to deal back channel and I'm not sure, I don't know, of course, because back channels are, by their very nature, unknown. Um, but I, I hope the administration is finding ways to do some back channeling of, of this. Very, bri very briefly, uh, I think one of, one of Xi Jinping's uh, <clears throat> problems in one running the country is that uh, he has arrogated too much power to himself to the extent that his advisors, even Liu He, who, who went to the same high school as himself uh, in the 50s, 60s, uh, it, it, it's very doubtful Liu He um, uh, is in a position to tell uh, Xi Jinping what, uh, what he needs to be told. And um, we have seen a um, at least marginalization of Liu He's influence and um, um, similar things have happened to some of his other major advisors, for example, Wang, Wang Huning, who used to be a, a, an effective advisor on international um, economics, uh, international um, relations and so forth. And instead of Liu He, uh, Xi Jinping seems to, seems to be putting more trust upon the um, chairman of the NDRC, the National Development Re Reform Commission, um, He Lifeng, who used to work with him in uh, Fujian province way back in the uh, 70s, 80s. So, so one problem with uh, with this 
um, otherwise very useful uh, back channel uh, uh, relationship is that the, the ch- uh, that there are only a small number of people uh, she can trust to to handle this delicate task, right? Mm. Thank you all. And I forgot to mention at the start that if you could please keep your questions short, uh, that way we can get more of men. So I think. Thank you. A uh, reporter from Voice America. I, I, I'm going to ask a related question. Uh, instead of asking what the Xi Jinping should do to solve the problem, the situation, the pushback, the global pushback against China. So I'm going to ask why why there is a global pushback against China now. And in China, the critics sort of saying that Xi Jinping giving up China's, uh, Deng Xiaoping's Tao Guang mm. Yanghui too early. So I'm just wondering. That Tao Guang Yanghui, for those who don't speak biting, Chinese, is yeah. Yeah, biding your time, and, Bide your time. Uh, hiding your capability. Thank you. Um, I, I think, um, simplistically, I think First of all, the, the c- concern about containment from the U.S. Um, has been a near universal in China since at least 1989, if not before, when um, since Dulles's speech in the mid-50s where he used the term peaceful evolution to describe the U.S. Uh, um, to policy in terms of East Asia, China has been concerned about this idea of hostile forces and, and infiltration. So uh, this idea now that sort of there's this strategy of containment and Trump is feeding it, um, I just think that's a baseline here that's been uh, that's been in existence for, forever. That doesn't explain why we're in this new paradigm shift, to me at least. I think 2016 was a, a pretty significant watershed year. It certainly was in the EU where you saw a, a massive investment coming in uh, from China um, into some strategically important sectors. Uh, and at the same time you had that, you also had, I think, a, a waning of the, uh, the dividend of the third plenum, which Professor Wilder mentioned, which came out in 2013. So that was the, th- the third plenum document, which essentially said market forces will, uh, will, will uh, allocate resources. And, and for I was in Beijing at the time advising companies, and that was this big, see, we told you, we just had to give them time. And, and, and that, that sort of, I think by, by 2016, that had ground down to essentially a, a halt. So you have this convergence of forces of an, extre- an increasingly strained credulity of, of the business community. You had, I think, this massive uh, outflux of Chinese in, in investment, which really surged throughout that year, but in strategically significant ways. You had the announcement of Made in China 2025, which was sort of uh, n- nakedly predatory. Uh, and then you had the 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 sort of the the casting off of or the shedding of the mask from Xi Jinping about what his political ambitions were vis-a-vis his own position in power, but also vis-a-vis the party's uh, uh, position in in Chinese society. And so it was no longer credible to say, yeah, we know there's this communist party, but it's basically in the back behind the curtain and not really doing anything. Suddenly, the, the sort of the sickle and hammer uh, were, were everywhere in, in Beijing, and you start to saw, you know, see this is when the movement to get party uh, sort of rewrite articles of association in SOEs, but then in JVs, really started to get to get a push. You had this big push on party building, so now suddenly companies were hearing about the Communist Party cell for the, for the, for the very first time, and it culminated, I think, with with the 19th Party Congress, where Xi Jinping said, North, South, East, West, Center, the party leads everything. And if you lead everything, there's not much room in there for, for any sort of nothing. So uh, I think it was that convergence of forces which really brought this to a head, and then sort of sprinkle on top uh, the the sort of um, the feeling that globalization is, was not benefiting folks in the U.S. in in throughout Europe, in the U.K. So you had this more nativist, isolationist stance coming through. Nationalism was rising as as people were beginning to withdraw from the the sort of nineteen post nineteen eighty nine end of history blue jeans Coca Cola you know, uh, globalization narrative. And so I think it was just sort of a perfect storm of these forces. And maybe it took Donald Trump to sort of drop the match on, um, but he certainly wasn't the, the the cause of this. And if I'm being honest, if I'm putting blame on this for anyone, I guess I'd blame Xi Jinping for just uh, casting off what was an, a, rem- a remarkably effective strategy that Deng Xiaoping outlined of, let's stay quiet, let's stay humble, and, and let's get get rich and powerful. I was gonna say anything, anything, thing to add. That was pretty good. Reading off of his notes. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I guess Xi Jinping and his comrades uh, squandered a very valuable opportunity uh, immediately after the global financial crisis because China was a country which was not hurt by the uh, crisis. And instead, because they had uh, a lot of foreign exchange reserves, they took the advantage of um, buying huge chunks of oil uh, concessions in different countries and also protecting soft power. I think the, the, the problem with... Um, the Chinese projection of soft power is that uh, they do not deign to um, uh, take reference from global norms. So, uh, while well, many countries have institutes like the Confucius Institute, for example, but they are using the Confucius Institute in a, uh, a very unsubtle way of trying to um, um, uh, push forward the Chinese way of doing things, and uh, there have been many reports, some of which are credible, that the China uh, Chinese institutes have relations with the, with the Ministry of State Security. But more broadly, I think, uh, is the fact that, uh, for example, the most cited example of China's overarching uh, geopolitical ambition, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, well, according to a report by uh, 27 EU ambassadors to uh, Beijing, which was published a few months ago, uh, most of these deals, this huge multi-billion US dollar deal, uh, were struck between uh, SOE conglomerates and, and local governments. Uh, they, they do not follow international uh, standards of bidding, uh, transparency, and so forth. And um, recently, uh, the Czech Republic uh, had a lot of problem because uh, the one major uh, PRC investor in the Czech Republic, the CEFC Energy Company based in Shanghai, which is actually a, a, a PLA company and a, a bogus company to the extent that it is run very badly, uh, uh, its business formulation is just to bribe uh, officials in uh, Africa and maybe even in Eastern Europe. So that CFC energy company, of course, was um, <clears throat> penalized by the state and now absorbed by another uh, state-owned enterprise conglomerate, the city. So I think uh, in order to project power, power effectively, um, the Chinese government has at least to take some to take into consideration some criteria of century of, of decades old um, criteria and norms which have been followed by the West and some other countries. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, everyone. I think we have time for one more question, and I think it's going to be the gentleman here with the amazing tie. I, nobody here can see it, but it's it's the American flag with an eagle on it. <laughs> so, if you would, sir. Yeah. Can't, I'm sorry. Can you say it? In, can you say it into the mic? Yeah. My name is Michael Baker. I wanted to ask a question about how the Chinese acquisition of our debt paper makes us vulnerable as we try to put pressure back on China. Um, it is certainly an option that the Chinese could go to, but the difficulty is they actually will hurt from selling that paper. Um, there is, you know, it, it isn't that simple that you just pull out and um, you're, you're in good shape. They feel they need to be in the American marketplace um, uh, for stability reasons um, still. And I think that somebody, I think the New York Times called it a nuclear weapon. I don't, I, again, I don't think China is at the point of using nuclear weapons. They want a deal, and they're not going to do something that makes it impossible to get a deal with the American administration at this point. That may change, but so far, I, as I said, am impressed by the restraint on the Chinese side. Uh, I, I don't know that anybody that I have heard has, on the Chinese side has even hinted at using that particular tool because it is such a disruption of the international system. Yeah, and I think, actually, if I can hop in here, I'm, I, economics is sort of my thing. So it, not only is are they unwilling to use it, it, they're almost entirely unable to use it. They hold about $3 trillion in treasury bills. 
those bills are there because they're a tool that they use to manage their exchange rate and to manage the balance within their economy. And once they begin selling off large amounts of those treasury bills, their tre their exchange rate goes crazy. It, it messes up the functioning of their economy. So they, they don't really have the option to sell them all at once as one would if one were detonating a nuclear weapon. Uh, one other thing is who's gonna buy $3 trillion worth of US treasury bills? You know, like you might be able to sell those off on the open market over a longer period of time. But if you were going to over unload three trillion dollars in U.S. Treasury bills all at once, it'd be very difficult to find a buyer or buyers for that in a very short period of time. Without these challenges. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anybody else? No. Maybe one more. Yeah, I think we've got time for one more. Mike Runners, I think, uh, I, I don't know who had their hand up first. I'm sorry, people who don't get to ask questions. Uh, can, can you comment about how long how long you think the trade war competition will last? Sorry, real quick, who are you? John Honovich, IPBM. Cool. Um, can you comment a little bit on how long you think it's going to last? And if it lasts longer, what's the impact you perceive domestically in the PRC? Well, if my, if I may hazard a guess, um, most likely it, it, it will last through 2019. It will last through 2019. And um, uh, well, Xi Jinping will be facing more crisis because I think um, despite um, the unanimous views which uh, the panel has uh, that uh, as long as Xi Jinping has control of the army and the police, nobody can challenge him. But the fact that um, if this were to drag on, um, I think it becomes very obvious to uh, forward-looking um, cadres and officials in the party and government, as well as intellectuals, economists, and so forth, that Xi Jinping doesn't have what it takes to, to, to solve the problem. And this could... Uh, put immense pressure on Xi Jinping, uh, particularly relating to the fact that he has just abrogated term limits. That means he might rule uh, realistically until uh, 2033 when he will be 80 years old. So the longer it drags on, I think, uh, the more pressure um, Xi Jinping will face regarding uh, the possibility of coming up with a... Uh, with a solution which you can sell both to the Chinese people and the global community. I would just say that for the reasons that Willie gave, um, I think in his own interest, it is in Xi's interest to find a way to solve this sooner than the end of 2019. Um, so, you know, it's not about doing this for the United States or because you think the United States is right, it's, it's because this is starting to destabilize your system. And so um, I guess I'm a tad more optimistic about the timeline. Good. All right. Well, that is the end of our first panel today. We're going to go into a coffee break now and we're going to come back. Hang on real quick. We're going to come back promptly at 10.45 with our second panel. <laughs>